Thus far, we've talked about how to read in data, and later we're going to talk about how to build models to make predictions on that data. But something really important that comes before you make predictions and after you make predictions is understanding what's going on inside your data. And to do that, you need to be able to look at your data and to understand what's going on. And you often can't do that by looking at the raw data themselves. You need to visualize them in some way. Now, you can take an entire course on data visualization, and I encourage you to do so. But uh, we're just going to cover the basics in this course so that you can get a sense of what's going on in your data and perhaps diagnose problems. The reason that we're talking about it in a data science class is that you simply cannot build a good model on noisy data. And once your data get large enough, it's impossible to go through a file and look at the data and understand what's going on and where there are problems. And while we may be able to do that for hundreds of observations, once you get into thousands, it's simply impossible to find patterns and discover issues on your own without some sort of assistance. And that's where data visualization can come in. You can understand what's going on inside your data so that as you build a model later, you can detect problems and you can see how well your model lines up with the reality of the underlying data. We're going to be talking about a particular formalism for doing visualization called the grammar of graphics. And the reason I like the grammar of graphics is that it doesn't focus on manipulating individual pixels in an image. Even though it gives you a level of generalization, it's still relatively powerful and lets you create really compelling graphics. This framework is most commonly used in an R package called ggplot2, and we're going to be using some of the examples from uh, Hadley Wickham's uh, introduction to that book, which is also part of the reading for this week. But we'll be using a Python package called Plot9 that has many of these same features. It's not quite as robust or as well documented as ggplot2, but uh, I'm not going to ask you to learn a different programming language R if you're already very comfortable building models and cleaning data in Python. There are many reasons I like this framework for building graphics. One reason that I like it is that you can very easily plug different visualizations together, or different components of visualizations together. And this allows you to create really advanced graphics from very simple building pieces. And it also has reasonable defaults. And so if you're just getting started, say for example in a course like this, if you do something it won't be too crazy and you can use that to slowly refine your graphics over time to create something really interesting or to understand what's going on inside your data. So let's start with a really simple data set. We have four observations, two continuous coordinates that we'll call x and y, and one discrete coordinate that we'll call the shape. And what we want to be able to do is to be able to figure out the two different types of data that we have in this data set, uh, the A's and the B's, and how we can tell a story with those data. And in particular, how do we contrast those two groups with each other? So one thing that the grammar of graphics allows us to do is to transform components of our data into things that make sense for a visualization. So for example, we may want to turn the A's and B's into different shapes, and we'll display them somehow in a graphic. And so in the language that ggplot2 and plot9 use, these are called geometries. So the geometries are the shapes of the images that will be displayed on your screen. You can also have things like coordinate systems that tell the values of the elements that you're attaching to a plot. And then you can also have annotations like, say, the axes on a plot. So let's see a really example of doing that within Plot9. And so at this point, we have a pandas data set called Demo. And so Demo is our data set, and it's just a pandas data frame with the same columns that I showed you before, x, y, and shape. So what we're doing here is we're creating a grammar of graphics object. And so we do that by calling this ggplot function, and then we tell it what data we're going to look at, and here we're saying what aesthetic we're going to be using. And here we're going to say plot these points, and choose a color based on the shape, and then use 
y as the y-coordinate and x as the x-coordinate. And so these get plotted here, and so the A shapes are down here, the B shapes are up here, and we've also told it that we want these to be points. We want to plot these as points in, say, a scatter plot. Then uh, we tell Python, let's save this to a file, and then it saves it to a PDF that you can then insert into a document that you're writing up, or you can send it in an email, or whatever else you want to do with it. The nice thing about the grammar of graphics is that you can very easily swap out different components to create very different visualizations. So if you want to use something other than points to plot your data, you could do something like plotting a line. And here we have swapped out geometry point, geom point, for geom line. So this is the only thing that's changed here, and we have a very different graph as a result. There are also many other geometries that we could use. I'm not going to show you all of them, but another common one is using a bar geometry. And so here you say use geometry bar, geom bar, but you also need to tell it the uh, how tall to make that. And so here you're saying just use the value in uh, the y position for how tall that bar is going to be. And that's basically saying use the identity function to figure out how tall the bar is going to be. The nice thing about these frameworks is that when you choose to apply some aesthetic to a point, it makes reasonable selections for you. So for example, if you tell it the size of a point, and that's associated with continuous data, it will size a ball or a square, whatever shape is associated with it, to a size proportional to whatever value is associated with that column. So we could have another column in our data set that represents population or frequency or something like that. And in addition to the xy coordinates, we could say how big of a dot is it corresponds to this additional parameter. If we assign a color to a continuous parameter, then it goes on a spectrum, say, for example, from red to blue. And the larger the value is, the more blue that it gets, the smaller the value it is, the more red it is. And so here again, we're associating multiple variables to a single point that's being displayed, and we can associate that with either size or color in addition to the standard xy coordinates. We'll see an example of this in just a second. You can also do similar things for discrete data. So for example, you can have different shapes associated with different categories of data or different colors. And here, if you associate a color with discrete data, it does something very sensible. Instead of using a spectrum, it now uses as different colors as possible to show you the distinctions between these different categories. So you may have a plot that looks like what's going on on the left here. All your data is bunched up. And you may want to transform one or both of your axes to use a different scale. So instead of a linear scale, you may want to use a logarithmic scale. This can help expose, for example, exponential relationships in your data into something a little bit more easy to digest and see with our eyes. So for example, if you're looking at any sort of money value data, often it's very sensible to apply some sort of logarithmic scale uh, because as prices get really, really big, they can make it hard to see patterns throughout the entire range of your data. Let's go back to our very toy data set that we had before where we're trying to compare these two things, the, the circles and the squares. Another thing that you can do to help show the differences is to use what's called a faceted graph. And so let's say that you have uh, two states, Maryland and Virginia, and want to compare them. You could show the same data for both states side by side next to each other. And the nice thing about this is that now these graphs have consistent axes, you can tell what's going on, and uh, you can very easily compare left and right uh, to see how these two different data sets compare with each other. Sometimes it makes sense to try to do that in one graph using things like color or shape to differentiate the two groups. Other times putting it side by side tells a clearer picture. Many times you have so many variables, it's just simply impossible to put it all into a single graph. As I said before, it's possible and probably even a good idea to take a whole course in data visualization. We don't have time to go over all of that, 
And because we're working in Python, I want to give you enough of a brief introduction so that you can play around and discover trends and data visually. And this will be something that's really important to do before you build a model and for things like feature engineering that we'll talk about later. We'll use Plot9 in this course because it's a Python package. If you're using R for any reason, please take a look at ggplot2. It's uh, very full featured and many of the things that you can do in ggplot2 you can also do in Plot9 with very minimal changes to the syntax. Next we'll be talking about examples of what you can do to build nice visualizations in Plot9 and also what sorts of things you want to stay away from in creating plots that are less useful in conveying interesting information.